What's up, Lifeline Church? It's so good to be in the house of the Lord today. Before we get started, I just want to introduce myself to anybody who may not know me. My name is Elliot. My wife, Tiffany, and I, she was the one standing right here, the cute little thing standing right here. My wife, Tiffany, and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Come on, give it up for yourselves because you guys are awesome, and I love Lifeline Church. We love you. All right, we're continuing in a series on the book of Romans. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles, if you got them, to Romans 12. Everybody say Romans 12. Romans 12. It's not what you think it's about. Some of you might think you know what Romans 12 is about. But I'm here to tell you there is a little more in there that's going to be just so fantastic. You're going to love this. The title of my message today is Body Parts. Body Parts. Go ahead, turn to your neighbor and say Body Parts. Yeah, hopefully that was your spouse you turned to when you said that. Body parts, body parts. Yeah, got your attention now. That's all right. I thought I was preaching to the youth. It's all right. It's all right. Body parts, and you guys are all, <laughs> body parts, body parts, body parts. Has anyone ever seen uh, a part of the body detached from the body? Has anyone seen a body part that was detached from the body? You know, like maybe a fingertip, maybe something like that. This, I have seen a body part detached from the body. It's disgusting. It's repulsive. It's not anything that you ever really want to see ever. But let me just tell you, um, it's painful too. It's painful too. It's this finger right here. It got smushed off. In fact, actually, what really happened was um, a shark bit it off. When I was saving my wife in Hawaii from sharks, no, that's not true. That's not true. Actually, actually, pit bulls. Pit bulls were running after this baby, and I was going to save this baby. I was like, no, I was going to save the baby in pit bulls. No, that's not true. That's not exactly what happened. It was actually ninjas. Ninjas. I was walking along minding my own business when ninjas came descending from the trees, and they were like, give me all your money. And I was like, I don't think so. And the ninja stars start flying, and I'm like, Neo, you know, they got the Matrix coming back for us. And I was like, Neo, like, wah, wah, wah. And the very last one cuts my finger off. This is a long fake story. I'm telling you that right now. But I have seen a body part detached from the body. And it's quite, it's quite disturbing and painful. Has anyone ever seen a person detached from their purpose? A person detached from their purpose. I have. It was me. I was detached from my purpose. I'm not even talking about being an alcoholic and a drug addict. I mean, that, that's obvious. But saved Christian Elliot was detached from his purpose. And let me tell you, it's, it's painful, it's unnatural, and it's, it's, it's just not good. It's just not good. But there's a lot that those two stories have in common. A part of the body that's detached from the body and a, perp, a person that's detached from their purpose have a lot in common. We've all had something that we really wanted to do in life. All of us have had something that we really want to do in life, but couldn't, we couldn't gain the ground. We had a dream, but it goes nowhere. We felt aimless. We felt meaningless. We feel pointless. You want to know what the real problem is? The real problem that I want to address today is that most people think that attaining their dreams, attaining their purpose, attaining their calling is an independent venture. It's something that we think we can do all by ourselves, all on our own as if we can find purpose and meaning that way, but they never can. Why? Because they never learned that we were created, every single one of us, to be a part of something greater than ourselves. That is a universal truth, that every single one of us were designed, created. We are in mind, planned out to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. The great misconception, indeed the grand deception, it's a deception that you can achieve purpose and calling all by yourself. That you can be happy and fulfilled in life without the partnership and unity of others. In fact, some of us might even think in this room today, listening online, might even think that it's by climbing over others, stepping on the backs of others, getting other people out of our way, then I'll have all the things that I wanted in life then I'll be able to achieve all the things. If all of these people would just behave or get out of the way, I'm just going to climb on their backs to get there. No, none of you. None of you would ever do that. That's, that's fantastic. You're a great group of people. I love that. Here's, a, here's something like, it, it would go something like this. 
Only if I achieve, if only I could achieve the desire of my heart, then I will be fulfilled, then I achieve financial independence, then I will be satisfied. There's a not so subtle selfishness to it all. It's not so subtle when you look at it that way. I, I picture people like this, people like I was, people like I can be, people like we all can be. I picture people like that that are thinking like that, like a finger detached from the hand with a nice gold ring on it. Like a finger all by itself right there. No hand, but a nice gold ring on it. Looking good, detached. I picture people like this, like a forearm cut off from the body, wearing a nice smartwatch or a nice Rolex. Detached, cut off, but you looking good. Oh yeah, you got, you got the stuff. You, you go in places in life. But when you're detached, that, that's how I picture it. It's like, man, you, uh, you got a nice set up there all by yourself. You got nice things going on in your life all by yourself. None of us were designed to live life that way. Here's the problem. Write this in your notes. You can follow along in your, in your notes if you've got those with you. You can follow along on Version Bible app. You can also uh, plug them in that way. Here's the problem. When you are not attached to something bigger than yourself, there will always be something missing. When you are not attached to something bigger than yourself, there will always be something missing. So in Romans 12, we're going to find out just what it means to be a part of something bigger. Paul speaks to, and I believe he solves the issue, how do I find true fulfillment? Anybody want to know that? (laughs) How do I find true fulfillment? I believe Paul talks about it in no better way than right here in Romans 12. Romans 12. He solves it. And how do we honor God while we're doing it? So let's start reading right here. Father, bless your word and let it sink deep into our hearts and change us from the inside out. Romans 12, starting in verse 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Everybody say bodies. To God. Because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. Why did he say living? He said, I don't want you to, to, to die for this. I want you to live for this because living for something means you have to die every day to your own decisions your own way about doing things when you live for someone think about it if I die for someone one time did it but if you live for someone that's a decision I have to wake up every day and do he said give your bodies to God as a living sacrifice he don't want you dead he wants you alive man some of you are like I didn't even know that about God. I thought he was mad at me. I thought he wanted to snuff me out. No, he wants you living, alive, breathing, well, powerful, serving him, for him, giving your bodies to God as a living sacrifice. This is truly the way to worship him. Now, this is is where most people think, oh, this is the worship passage. This is all about worship. You know, music. You know, music. But no, Paul is saying that worship is more than the 20 minutes that precedes the message on a Sunday. Worship is more than that. It's better. It's every day. It's lifelong. It's something we get to enjoy all the time. All the time. He goes on in verse 2 to say, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. It is only God's will for you that will please you. Man, a lot of us trying to find pleasure a lot of different ways. Hello? (laughs) A lot of us try to find pleasure a lot of different ways. But give your bodies to God as a living and holy sacrifice. Then you will know God's will for you, which is holy, pleasing, and perfect. You want to get pleased? Get in God's will and give your body to God as a living sacrifice. That's the only way to get pleased in life. That's the only way to live pleasing in life. Whew, that's a lot. Verse 3, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. It starts to switch a little bit. I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. That could be the root issue, too. I mean, that's why a lot of us don't want to be attacked, because we think, man, I sh- man, what you talking about? I'm a kneecap. Man, I'm a hand. Man, I'm out here. I'm good. I'm, I got this. He said, no, no, hold on, hold on, wait. Don't think of yourself better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourself by the, face, by the faith God has given us. Verse 4, just as our bodies have many parts, and each part, has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. I'm going to explain what Christ's body is in just a moment. Hang tight. We are many parts 
of one body. And we all belong to each other. Man, that's powerful. What did Paul just say? Paul just said, give your body to the body. That is worship. Worship is giving your body in service to God and to others. I'm preaching to the choir right now because y'all are in church during summertime. Man, you all, the, you all the saints right here. You guys are all strong. I'm, you guys all get this, and that's fantastic, but we're going to go deeper. That's our worship to him. Everything that he talked about up until this point has to do with that thing. We are many parts to one body. We belong to each other. That's how we don't become conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed in the renewing of our mind. That's how we worship. That's how we stay humble and don't think too much of ourselves. All of that has to do with us giving our bodies to the body. Verse 6, in his grace, God has given us different gifts to do certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith God has given you, if your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. If you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Speaking, serving, helping, cleaning, teaching, leading, encouraging, giving. Lots of ordinary parts put together can do extraordinary things. Write this in your notes. Your gift does not have to be grand. It just has to be given. Your gift does not have to be grand. It has to be given. That's it. That's how you're going to find fulfillment. That's how you're going to find purpose. That's how you're going to find true meaning. That's how you're going to please God. That's your true and proper worship, to give your body. Remember, we, we talked about this a lot. Some of you are glad I'm finally not talking about sin anymore in the book of Romans, man. The guide for living a good Christian life, this series on Romans has been a lot about sin. But today we're talking about some funner stuff how to get fulfillment in life, how to, how to live on another level, how to, how to reach a higher pinnacle of human existence, truly. Your gift doesn't have to be grand. It just has to be given. Every person plays a part and serves a purpose because we need each other. Adam had Eve, all right? Abraham had Sarah. David had Jonathan. Elijah had Elisha. Jesus had the 12. God made us to work in unity with each other, and unless we act like each of us plays a part in this thing that's bigger than us. This thing will never be bigger than us. Let that sink in. Unless each one of us begins to look at the church, the world, our lives, our families as being a part of something bigger than us, then it will never be any bigger than us. And we see a lot of people live life that way, where it's just all right here. It's all about me. It's all about what I can do. It's all about what I can take care of for myself. It's the lone wolf idea. Man, we, we have, like, made that so cool in America. That is, like, a cool thing, man, the lone wolf. Man, I got the tattoo to prove it. I don't. I don't have any tattoos. It's really weird. <laughs> Super drug addict, spent time in jail, not a single tattoo. I have, I have to explain myself and every single time. It's like, oh, you grew up in church, right? I'm like, I need a couple, of like, face tattoos to take care of this. This is crazy. It's the lone wolf idea. It's cool sounding but very underwhelming for practical living. A lone wolf is without a pack, running scared, forced to eat rats <laughs> because it can't hunt big game without its pack. It likes to eat big animals. They're tastier. But a lone wolf can never do that. They are designed and made. Wolves are designed and made to be a part of a pack, a part of a tribe. But the lone wolf, ooh, so cool. I got to eat garbage. <laughs> got to eat scraps. Because I'm not strong by myself. I was designed to hunt in like a pack. A lone wolf will never accomplish what a pack can accomplish. Never, ever. Such is true with us. You can survive all by yourself. You can survive. Yeah. You can get it done. You can survive. It'd be lame. <laughs> but you'll survive. It'd be great. But you won't be truly satisfied or successful. It's outside of your design, everybody. It's outside of your design to live this way. You could prefer quiet spaces and still belong to a pack too. Maybe some of you are saying, I like to be alone though, pastor. Can you talk to me please for a second? I got like most people going, yeah. Hey, me too. I, I do like 80% of my work in solitude in front of a computer, surrounded by computer screens, writing Word documents out like uh, all by myself. I, I don't mind being alone and you don't need to mind being alone either. You could still prefer quiet spaces and still belong to a pack. 
and belong to something bigger and be contributing to something bigger. And the stuff that you're doing in, in that introvert self that you are, you're contributing to something bigger than yourself. There's a lot of places for that in the body of Christ. Because I'm introverted and prefer to do my work alone, does that make me less useful? Not at all. Paul himself, the guy who wrote this passage in Romans, goes on to write in 1 Corinthians, he says this in chapter 12, in fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important. Has anyone felt weakest, least important? Some of those parts of the body that are weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. Isn't that true for our human bodies? He goes on to describe that a little bit, and we are in adult church. I thought about telling some jokes about that, and I thought, hey, man, keep it PG, man. Can you just keep it PG? And so I did. Parts of the body that are concealed a little bit more are actually very, very, very important. Some of the parts of the body that are behind the scenes, working on the stuff behind the scenes. Think about even this church. Think about what you're watching right now. You wouldn't even be able to hear me if there wasn't a sound booth. If there weren't people working without being seen for hours before you even got here. Some of the parts that seem weakest, that are outside of the limelight, are actually the most important. And he goes on in verse 27 to say, all of you together are Christ's body. And each of you is a part of it. My only point today is this. You can write this down. Don't be a body part. Be a part of the body. Don't be a body part. Be a part of the body. There is a big, glaring difference. Your dreams, your goals, your gifts, your talents, your charisma, your ministry, your wealth, detached from the body of Christ is a gold ring on a severed finger. A Rolex on an arm that's been cut off. When you detach those things from the body of Christ, you will, you'll get burned out. You'll get tired of doing it. You'll go to bed at night exhausted. You'll wake up in the morning not wanting to wake up, not excited about life. Anybody? Anybody. Come on. I felt that way. But it's when we're part of something bigger than us that we go to sleep like <sighs> excited. And we wake up going, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to get going. When we're a part of something bigger and we, and we get to see that vision come to life and we know we play a part in that, be a part of the body. Don't be a body part that think you're going to accomplish everything that God has for you all on your own. It'll never happen. It'll never work. And we are all susceptible to this line of thinking, all of us. It's called our sin nature. I've talked about it a lot in the last couple of weeks. Our nature is to want to draw back. I want to speak briefly to two groups. Um, first of all, if you're not a Christian, this is not my altar call, okay? <laughs> this is... Uh, I know I always talk like that. I think it's really important to talk like that. But if you're not a Christian or barely saved, new, freshly saved, maybe you feel newish. I use that term a lot, feel newish. Uh, maybe you've been around here a long time, you still feel newish. Or simply curious, maybe you're watching online right now and you don't even feel like you can stop in because that's why you're watching online. You feel that way. Maybe you're just vaguely interested in this whole Jesus thing. I want to tell you something. If that I, if you identify in that at all, I want to tell you, your dreams have value, a lot of value. Your goals, they matter. Your gifts and talents, there are gifts and talents that you have that the rest of us have been waiting for, even longing for. We've been waiting for you to be here with us, waiting for your gifts, waiting for your talents, waiting for the way that you will add to us. And we can be together and strengthen each other. We've been waiting for that. But until all those things, those goals, those dreams, those vision, are submitted to the body of Christ and become united with his body, which is the church body. All that language, when we say the body of Christ, we're talking about this right here. You are the body. And that church down the street that pre that's preaching Jesus right now as we speak, that's the body too. We're all the body. We're the body of Christ. That's why we say it that way is because of this in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 as well. That's why we call ourselves the body of Christ, in case you didn't know. That's why we're called the body. Until we submit those things to the body, until we submit our time, our talent, and our treasure, and we submit those things to the body of Christ, you and the body will be left incomplete. You're not the only one that will lose out. The body will lose out too. Think about when, when you lose an arm or you lose a hand or you lose a finger. Man, it's not just the arm that gets hurt. 
been, I've been focusing it on you, like you will be left wanting, but the body hurts too. The body's left without something that it was always designed to have. Is, is, this, is this sinking in a little bit? Like we need to get tight. We need to get close. We need to step in a little bit. We'll be left incomplete. Now, allow me to use, I, I put a lot of thought into, into proving this even outside of the Bible. Uh, I'm going to use um, psychology to help me prove my point today. Is that all right? I'm going to use psychology to help me prove my point today. There's uh, something called, um, I'm going to show you in a moment, um, Maslow, Abraham Maslow. He had something called this hierarchy of needs, and it was used, it used to top out at this thing called, so like there's a pyramid, right? It goes, I'll show you in a second. There's a pyramid, it goes like that, and at the bottom you got your, you got some needs, but at the very top of this human needs list was self-actualization. Ooh. Self, what does it mean to be self-actualized? And this is what psychology used to believe was the highest point. People who are fulfilled by doing all they are capable of. That's what psychology uh, used to believe. This is a very popular thing. You can Google this real easy and find it out. But I want to show you this picture right here. There is a modified version of this uh, needs triangle. Let me explain it to you. You might not be able to see this, but at the bottom it goes like this. You have, first, you have psychological needs. Like the very first thing that you need in life is nutrition, rest, exercise, anything that keeps the body healthy and strong. That's why the Bible says where well, you pray about someone to be, be well, hope you stay warm, but you don't give them a blanket, then you're, you're messing up because people have psychological needs that you have to meet first. And before you meet psychological needs, you can't really get to these next places. And the next need people have is to feel safety, to feel stress-free, ordered, routine, predictable. I live right here, right there in the safety need. I love it. Then right after that, they have the need to be loved, to feel love, to feel affection. That's a human need that we all have. I think a lot of us already know that, even though we would never say it out loud. Come on, guys. It's all right. It's all good. I'm not going to out you today. I already did. Next, you have esteem and power, stable, firm base. This is a modification. This is what Maslow believed in his later years. So in the 60s, right before he died, he, he figured something else out. It went to self-actualization, but on top of that is transcendence. After all this research, his whole life of learning, it's now a seven-level thing. And the end, the highest need that every single human being has, according to psychology, is transcendence. You want to know what transcendence means? When one finds the fullest satisfaction in giving oneself to something beyond oneself. Go figure, Maslow. I could have told you that. The Bible's been talking about that for like 2,000 years, but it's okay. You just take your time. You take your time and figure it out as, as much as you need. We've been knowing that, and I'm trying to tell you that right now. Psychology and the Bible agree. Science continues to prove the Bible true. I love that. It's one of my favorite things in life. But I know that for some of you in the room, um, the needs pyramid looks a little bit more like this, especially if you're a little bit younger. You know, the first need that you have, Wi-Fi. Don't, don't talk to me about food. Don't talk to me about water. Give me the Wi-Fi password. Then I'll tell you how hungry I am. Uh, I got a teenager in the house. I know that this needs triangle is much more accurate. Thank you very much. Get that off the screen. It's making me mad. <laughs> wow, that's why I got my Wi-Fi password locked tight. You get nothing. <laughs> Just kidding. You can have my Wi-Fi password. It's actually very easy. Psychology and the Bible agree. Give yourself to something bigger than yourself, and you will find fulfillment and honor God. And honor God while you're at it. Maslow called it transcendence, being a part of something bigger than yourself, but the Bible calls it being a part of a body of believers, being a part of something bigger than yourself. Now, I'm done talking to Y'all, um, um, newish folks, people that feel new, barely saved, y'all can plug your ears for a second because I got something to say to all you seasoned saints, all right? Plug your ears, and I got something to say to you who have been saved quite a while, that have been coming to church for a minute. It's not a lashing. I I'm just, I'm just want to bring something up. I'm not, that's not my personality at all. That's not how I get down whatsoever. But I, I want to direct my message to you for a moment. Your dreams have value. Your goals matter, okay? Just because you're a part of something bigger does not downplay the uniqueness that you have. What you bring to the table is so important. Your personality is so important. Your gifts, so important. Don't ever forget that. Who God made you to be, special, gifted, talented in your way, 
introverted, extroverted, whatever you got. It's important to God. But maybe, just maybe, you've been coming around long enough that this is all just routine by now. You're like, oh, yeah, I knew that. I know, yeah, I know. Mm -hmm, dreams found. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm, I know what to say. Yeah, yeah, I knew that. I challenge you Christians. So if you're newish, newly saved, plug your ears. I got to tell the Christians something. How exactly are you giving your body to the body to add value and to a vision and mission that's greater than yourself? How exactly are you doing that? We're going to talk about that some more. It's like this. Think about it. Uh, I was trying to think about how to describe this to you. Think about a thousand cut off hands. What can they get done? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. They can make a pile that you can like stand on maybe. That's gross. <laughs> I, didn't, I did not think I was going to say that today. <laughs> but a thousand disembodied hands get nothing done. But one hand attached to the body, man, it could get just about anything done. It's amazing. Did you know that science continues to prove this point? Did you know a horse by itself, a pulling horse, can pull 8,000 pounds. That's a lot of pounds. That's like, anybody drive an SUV to church today? Raise your hand up if you drove an SUV to church. Oh, I know some of you. There we did that right there. 8,000 pounds, that's a big car. Sport utility vehicle, 8,000 pounds, a horse can pull one. But if you got two horses pulling, they don't, they don't pull 16,000, they pull 24,000. It's called exponential strength. One horse can pull an SUV, two horses can pull a garbage truck. It's called exponential strength. God designed our universe to work that way. doesn't make a whole lot of sense. To be honest with you, I don't get that. Why does that work? I don't know. I have no clue. God just made it work that way. It is a proven fact. One plus one does not equal two. It equals three. And it goes up from there. It goes up from there. I got something I want to show you. Uh, can somebody help me with this blanket right here? Take those off there. These cups, anybody know what these cups are called? Solo. That's right. they called solo cups. And one by itself can do a lot. One by itself can get a lot of things done. You know, it's got some strength to it. You know, it can, it can hold up a little bit. I'm going to put this cup. Can everybody see this cup? I'm going to put this cup right there. This cup is going to represent a person. This cup is going to represent a person. And we're going to see just how much pressure a person can hold when they're all by themselves. This is the leaf of my dinner table. It's kind of heavy. This, this leaf of my table is going to represent vision and mission. This church has a lot to do with vision and mission. We have a large mission and a large vision because God has a large vision and a large mission for his church. It's, pre it's pretty big, but do you think... Um, do you think one person can handle this? You want to find out right now? One. Hold on. I want you guys to see this. Do you, do you think so? Who thinks that this can handle it? Do you think it can handle it? One, two, three. Yikes. What about a little bit more? Oh, that was just, that was not fair. You stepped on it. Well, the devil, the devil's real. Let me just tell you. Take a look at how this cup is doing. This is how a lot of you feel. <laughs> this is what a lot of churches look like. You got a big mission and a big vision all riding on one person. And you got, or let's just say everybody's kind of separate. Oh, I got a vision over here, but oh, I got a vision over here, and I got a vision over here, and it comes in by and squishes everybody Independently, you got one person who's trying to carry the vision by himself, by herself, in these local churches. And this is what destroys churches. This is why churches close. This is because we were never meant to do life alone. This is what some of you look like. Because you're trying to carry the pressure and the burdens of life all by yourself. And this is exactly how you feel today, like a pancake. It's crushing you. It's weighing you down. It hurts. What do you suppose would happen if we put a few people together? I got this. What do you suppose would happen? Actually, you know what? I do need your help. If, how many is this? Like 40. 
Come on up here. He's good. No, I need you. I need you right here. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna help you with that. Reuben, I got this. Thank you. Help me with this other side and walk over here with me. Come on, jump up here. You got it. You're flexible. He said, no, nah, I ain't trying it. <laughs> I ain't trying it. Tell me the truth. Do you think that, you know, like, let me see, 11 by 4. It's 44. 44. Do you think that, uh, that's actually very average-sized church, 44. Um, do you think they can carry this, this mission, this vision? Let's find out. Ooh, yeah, that's nice right there. Thank you, my brother. This is what the church was made to look like. This is what your life was made to look like. How you feeling now? Tall, strong. Man, you even portable. You can get around. Because I think, I, th I think we would all be surprised at what would crush one person. When people come together, we can handle a lot more than we ever could alone. Y'all didn't see that coming. It's called, listen, it's called exponential strength. It's called when we get together, we are exponentially stronger than we ever could be apart. And when we come together as the body of Christ, as, as worshipers, as administrators, as encouragers, as teachers, when we come together and stand side by side, putting our differences aside, but coming close and getting into groups of people to say, there is a mission and a vision that is bigger than me, and I'm going to be a part of this thing. I'm going to be a part of the body of Christ now. I'm going to come together with my family, and I'm going to get over myself. I'm going to not think highly, more highly of myself than I should, but no, I'm going to partner with the body because even when the pressure comes, because you all know, pressure, don't be scared. You scared. Don't be scared because what would terrify one cup by itself you're looking, at, you're looking at what the church is supposed to look like. You got a few of us together that can carry infinitely more than what the world thinks is possible. And you got a church of the size of a smaller church even. That's, that's paying people's bills. That's, that's paying for the school district to be able to do things. That's coming in and even the government is looking for help. Even a small body of believers can do infinitely more together than we ever could apart. Can I get an amen on that? Come on, somebody. So what can we do? What can we do to get this done? Don't do life alone. You might be surprised at the results. You might be surprised. I stood on that thing, jumped up and down, not a crack. Does anybody want to live life like this? Where pressure comes, things are, I'm, I'm carrying things on my shoulder that's like giant. That when we do this, recovery centers are built. New churches are planted. People coming together and the, everything is blowing up. When we truly come together, we accomplish infinitely more together than we ever could apart. I got some action steps for us. Let's talk about this. Number one, you could join the dream team. Some of the stuff you hear me talk about so much. But listen to me, you will never know what purpose feels like until you make a difference in the life of another person. You'll we wrote it. We wrote it right there under Dream Team. Man, it's all based on Romans 12, um, 1 Corinthians 12, but I couldn't put all those chapters on there, so I just summarized it. That's when you, that's when you experience purpose is when you make a difference in the life of another person and come on to a team Jerry Rice all by himself can't win a Super Bowl. Come on, somebody. He needs a team, and so do we. We need to live as a part of a team. Growth track, step one, is in two weeks. Man, put it in your calendar. And if you have not yet taken our growth track, put it in your calendar. Two weeks from now, the first Sunday, every single month, make a commitment. Say, yeah, I, I want this in my life. I want to be stronger together. Yeah. It, you, you'll be surprised at how much life that gives you. Dream team is not... We come in and we empty ourselves and we're, we do this for others, but it's amazing what it does for us. <laughs> it's amazing what it does for us. This morning I was getting ready and we were, we were practicing and everything, and I look around, people are laughing, people are smiling, people are slapping each other's backs, people are having a good time. Dream Team is such, is such an important aspect of what the church is designed to do. And step four is today. 
of our growth track. It's four steps, one, two, three, and four. If you've been to any other step, come to step four today. Some of our leaders will be there, and we'll get you plugged into a team, man. You can do this. If you've not taken any step of growth track, do, do step one first. We encourage you to do that. Um, but if you've been to any other step, come to this one today. It'll be short. It'll be sweet. Me and my wife will be there. It'll be great. You'll love it. Just, just check it out. And taste and see that life together is even better. At Lifeline, we don't use the jobs that we need to do. Uh, we don't use people to get those done. We actually use the jobs that need to get done to get people together. It's, it's a little bit backwards from the normal. We, people typically, you know, oh, I need, I need people to come and do this. I need people to come and do this. Hey, you, can you do this? Hey, you, can you do this? We try. We try to say, hey, there's a job over here. This is a perfect opportunity to get a group of people together. Because when people, when groups of people come together, we have life. We have life. Number two, you can join a life group. Man, there are so many life groups happening right now. Life is better together, everybody. This is super simple, an easy way for you to do just this so you can handle the pressure of life. The Bible says this in Ecclesiastes 4.12, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. A person alone can be attacked and defeated. When you are alone, you can get stepped on. The pressure weighs you down. This is exactly what happens. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. That's when, that's when the pressure comes and, and things come into your life so heavy. But when you're together as a part of a group, there's people there who love you. There's people who beat you to the hospital when you get sick because those people know you. They know you so well. And let me just, I'm just going to admit to you, that doesn't typically happen only coming to church on Sundays. Our goal is to have better attendance in life groups than on Sundays. Like if we got 150 on Sunday, I'd like to see 100, 170 at life groups. Because when people are away on vacation or for the weekend or whatever, but nobody misses their life groups. Because those are my people. Those are my groups. Man, I got something really, really cool. I, I'm uh, sort of running out of time, but I got to share this with you. It's so important to me, and it's, it, it means a lot to me. I want to share a, a, a couple, about a couple groups uh, in particular, because, you know, this whole life group model, small groups, you've heard of them. We didn't come up with that here. We didn't come up with that. We actually have a lot of pastors and churches that love us and care about us, and they give us the systems, they give us the models, and they're like, hey, use it. Change the verbiage. Let it be yours, because you may not, might not know this, but we're not in competition with each other. The churches are not in competition with each other. In fact, they want us to succeed. It's great. So we didn't come up with that, but I was like scoping out some other churches, some friends of mine's churches, and I was looking over their life groups to see what they got going on, and I noticed the difference between our, some of our groups and theirs. We, we had something. Now, a little bit like, I got a little excited about it. You know, I was like, oh. This we have what we call um, outreach-based life groups, outreach-based, where not only are people coming together and loving one another, they, they meet together, and then they go out and make a difference and feed the needy. <laughs> and they put clothes on people's backs, and, and they make meals for people, and they go out the highways and byways and actually make a difference. And I was looking at a bunch of other churches, life groups, nothing like that. And I got, I'll tell you the truth, I, I was a little, I was like, I had a little bit of pride. Not like sin pride, but like, that's my family. They are so awesome. They, we're not just lifeline the name, like we are love being a lifeline that people would come through and say no we're gonna we're gonna do a life group that actually goes out and does something now that being a part of a life group and, and not doing anything except eating froyo come on somebody shameless self-promotion right there i got gifts too eating sweets i got, I got spiritual gifts like eating tacos or eating uh eating froyo those are my gifts but I just wanted to take a moment and brag on some of the groups that we have. They're so amazing. Any group, maybe it's an outreach group, or maybe it's just one of the groups that's going to study the message from the week before. We got we groups on pretty much every day of the week. Find one that works for you. That's a way to be a part of the body of Christ right there. Number three, jo uh, join an equip class. Join an equip class. Even though the goal here, the whole point of my message is to be a part of the body and not a body part, that still leaves room for self-strengthening. Like, you can be a stronger arm, right? You can be a more skilled hand and be a part of the body. That's a good thing to want. 
Our equip classes are designed to do that. 2 Timothy 3, all scriptures inspired by God, useful to teach what is true, make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong, teaches us to do what's right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Equip classes start with a worship night on July 10th. Hey, you don't want to miss this. If you've never been a part of an extended time of worship, um, you'd be surprised what kind of chains can get broken. You'd be surprised at what kind of healing can take place in your life when you just come and say, you know what, I'm going to come for an hour. We got child care. Come on, somebody. It's good. I can come over there and just like, I'm going to bring a book or something and just relax the whole time. Do what you need to do. Come on down, though. Check it out. And then right after that, you can sign up for any one of our equipped classes. You can do that online on the website. But come on down July 10th and then July 17th, the week after, is when classes start. And there's prayer right before that and a little bit of meal. A little bit of food for you. Anybody, like, want to get some free food? Come on down. Like, we're going to tease you over here. Come on. It's going to be great. Last one. Stay connected. Last application step. Stay connected. There will always be a tendency to slip away. Not for me to. I, I have experienced this. I'm sure all of you have too. There is a tendency to want to draw back. There's a tendency to want to go Ah, uh, you know what? But I'm not doing that good right now. You know, I better just come over here. I'm just gonna. Yes, you know, uh, I just don't feel good. I can't face them. I can't show up and do that smiley face thing. I just can't do that right now. It's a tendency. It's a tendency and a temptation and it's a trap. It's a trap because that's exactly the way how the enemy wants to pick you off. That's how he wants to get you out there because he can't stomp you out here, but he can definitely stomp you out when you come out from that. When you come out from that protection, when you come out from that unity, that group, there is life being a part of a body. Stay connected. Listen to how you're going to do this. Um, this application step is actually, um, the way I wrote it is kind of mean. <laughs> but I'm say it anyway. You need to do things now and set things up today that prepare you for your own bad choices. <laughs> Because we all make bad choices and you need to do things today. Listen to how the Bible says it. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. <laughs> Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. But he who walks in the way of wisdom is delivered. You all do this already. You all do this when you need to remember something important that you need to take with you when you leave the house in the morning. But the night before, where do you leave it? By the door. You leave it by the It's the smart part of your brain that plans things out. Protecting the, the simpler part of your brain that's going to be tired in the morning, that's going to forget that thing that you need to take with you. So what I'm saying is do things today, like sign up for these things or text a friend. Tell them right now while you're thinking about it because there's a good chance you're looking at me going, oh, that's a good idea. I should do that. But I know I ain't that good of a preacher to make you remember this tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, you're going to be back to work. You're going to be doing back to the things. That you need to do something now that's going to help you for when you actually need the help. You need to set yourself up for success in that way. Text a friend and say, hey, I, I know I need to be in church every week. So can you, like, text me on Saturday night? Can you come and pick me up? Can you sit with me? That's the smart part of your brain helping the <laughs> simpler part of your brain. That's going to come to the weekend and say, oh, I just don't feel like it. We all already do this. I'm telling you to do it with your spirituality. I'm telling you to do it with being a part of the body of Christ. You can totally do this. Make commitments today so you know you are good and held accountable. Don't be a body part. Be a part of the body. Make a commitment to something bigger. Taste and see that life together is infinitely better than life lived alone. What if the people who called themselves Christians would commit to this principle in Romans 12? What if just all of us here would do that? What if every severed body part came in to be a part of the body of Christ? What if all of you who are gifted, talented, caring, compassionate, giving, and called by God would come together in relationship? How would this church be different? How would our city be different? It would be different. Let me tell you how it would be different. Broken hearts would get restored if we would just stick together. If we would be one body instead of body parts meeting in one room. But we would be a, would be 
of one body together. Broken hearts would get restored. The lost, the least, and the lonely would find hope in Jesus. We would be a lifeline to this community exponentially more than we ever could just trying to do stuff all by ourselves. The sick would be healed. Recovery centers would be built. New nonprofits would be started to serve the city. And the world would know Jesus by the way we work, live, and love together. And it happens when you and I walk in humility saying, I'm going to be a part of this thing. I'm choosing to be a part of the body of Christ. It's a choice that you and I get to make. Hear me, everybody. There's a point to this that I didn't mention yet, and it's so important. Christ is the head. Christ is the head of the body. Now, a body without a part is a setback. A body without a head is without life. A body can get by without, its, without a part. Like, we can get by if some folks that are out of the fold aren't around. Like, we can get by. But when we are trying to live our lives without Christ, that is not life. And we're losing out on life. A person without a church is a setback for the person and the church. But a person without Jesus as their Savior is like a body without a head, without life. Jesus is the beginning. He's the end. He's the center. He's our first need. He's our final need. And through him, every need is met. Without Jesus, I'm just a motivational speaker. Without Jesus, there's no point. We can accomplish great things, but without Jesus at the center, we've accomplished nothing. We need Jesus at the center of everything we do. That's what we rally around. Without Jesus, we have good ideas but no hope. Today, I want to offer hope. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we close today. Father, I know that there are many of us here that, that want to be closer with you, that we feel disconnected. We feel disconnected not only from the church. We feel disconnected from our families. We feel disconnected from our friends. We feel disconnected from life itself. Lord, we need to be closer to you. We want to be closer to you. We want to be attached. Lord, we need this. We need you. And when we come humbly before you, we just bow our hearts today. Lord, we give ourselves to you. Anyone here who knows they're, they're not where they should be with Jesus? Anybody here who wants to rededicate or commit their life to Christ and say, Lord, I'm, I'm giving my life, my body, as a living sacrifice. I'm ready. Today's the day. I've thought about it. And I'm, it's time. I'm making a commitment for you, God. I'm giving my body as a living sacrifice. I just want to pray for open hearts. Father, open the hearts of every single person who needs to make a commitment for you, who's ready to take a step, who's ready to come forward, who's ready to say, God, it's not all about me anymore. It's not all about the things I want to get done. It's not about the ministries that I want to do. It's not about me, my needs, my toys, my career. Lord, it's about you, and I'm ready to give all these things to you, I'm ready to make a commitment for you. Anybody who wants to commit their lives to Jesus, heads down, eyes closed, I want you to just lift your hand and say, that's me. Father, I give my life to you. Go ahead, lift it up right now. Be bold. Be bold. Hallelujah, I see you. Hallelujah, I see you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Church, hallelujah, I see you too. Church, anybody who this is your prayer, this is your heart. This is your cry to give your life to Jesus. Repeat after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross, to be raised again, to conquer death, to forgive me for all my sins. I give my body as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to you. Lead me, guide me, and fill me. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we, can we just celebrate one time? Come on.